is the Grow Your Clinic podcast from Clinic Mastery. We help progressive health professionals to lead inspired teams, transform client experiences, and build clinics for good. Now, it's time to grow your clinic. Welcome to the Grow Your Clinic podcast. My name is Ben Lynch, and in this episode, we speak with Melissa Yusva of Solution Psychology in Melbourne, Victoria. Through this episode, we explore Melissa's passion for helping the next generation of therapists and supporting her team through training and development, not only clinically, but personally as well. We explore how that translates into pathways for retaining great team members and also acts as a really great attraction for the next generation of team members in recruitment. Through this podcast, we talk about the challenges and definition of leadership for Melissa, some of the learnings through the COVID period, and the attention to detail that Melissa has when scaling up the systems and support for her team and especially her clients. You're going to find a lot of little pearls in this episode, and I encourage you to identify just one thing that comes up from Melissa's decades of experience that might just make a meaningful difference for you in your journey as you grow your clinic. All right, let's pick up the conversation with Melissa. You've just returned from your team retreat. We have, yeah. Where'd you go? Tell me we all about talk, it. We went to um, Torquay or Janjuk um, and it was amazing. I couldn't have asked. It's actually pouring today. Um, <laughs> so it, it's, um, it just was perfect. I couldn't have asked for it to go more smoothly and more according to the brief that I had given uh, myself and Claire, my practice manager. Mm -hmm. uh, it had just everything um, just went off without a hitch. It just was perfect. The, the theme was reflect and connect. And I think we got a really good balance uh, mm -hmm. of both of those things. So it was just amazing. It was our first retreat and um, wow. It was, it, it was amazing. Amazing. First retreat, go off without a hitch. Yeah. That's awesome. So reflect and connect, where did that come from for you? What inspired that to be the theme? I think we've had, um, you know, everyone's had a really hard couple of years, but particularly um, in Melbourne. And yes. A pediatric clinic. It's been yes. really, really tough. So I just wanted to give the team an opportunity to, uh, just really reflect on the awesome job that they've done over the last couple of years and just acknowledge how hard it's been. It's been really, really hard. And I just wanted them to take some time out. We deliberately chose the end of the year. We, we really wanted it to be um, after we've closed the clinic. We closed the clinic early and we really wanted it to be um, at this time of year so that they didn't have to think about going back to work and they could just really just close off and and just think about what they've done and what they've achieved and um, and just celebrate that. Uh, so that was the reflect part. And then just connect as a team. We've got a lot of new team members mm -hmm. um, and we haven't had that opportunity because we've been so so busy um, in, in damage control over the last couple of years. So just um, that opportunity to connect with each other and, and get to know some of our newer team members and just get to know each other. We've got some team members who have been with us for a long time but only work one day a week, so they just don't get to see um, the other team members across the week. So just a chance to connect with each other. Um, so I think, we've, I think we really nailed the brief Um even though it was one I set for myself, I think <laughs> I think we that really nailed uh, we really nailed the brief and and had that opportunity to um, to have a chance to to do both reflection and connection and um, and we ended with a really lovely activity where I gave um, the team the task to put together a two minute uh, reflection uh, on their year. Um, it could be anything they wanted. It could be a TikTok. It could be a verbal presentation. It could be um, some of them did their own Zoom where they just spoke about, um, they recorded themselves speaking about mm -hmm. their year and it could be um, work-related or not work-related. So we had just some amazing reflections on their personal journey that they've had this year. And uh, we learned some things about each other that we didn't know. Uh, so that, that was a, a just a, a beautiful way to finish. 
um, the retreat. So yeah, that is a beautiful touch on on the retreat. The retreat sound like an opportunity for people to share and be vulnerable with one another. Yeah. How have you gone about creating that space? for people to open up like that, whether as some things that you did specifically during the retreat and no doubt in the lead up, can you give us an insight into how yeah, you've been able so to create that? I think it's being vulnerable myself. Mm. Um, so, you know, I, a few years ago, um, I read Dare to Lead um, by Brene Brown. Great book. Um, and so I think over the last few years, I've been vulnerable in front of my team. So yes. I'm not afraid to um, be vulnerable in front of them. And uh -huh. uh, and I think they've seen that. And so, um, you know, my, I don't think, my, I think they're, they're getting braver. I don't mm -hmm. think, I think some of them um, are, are seeing other people stand up and share things with the team that are really hard um, to share. Um, and they see me stand up and, and share things that are hard to share. They've seen me stand up and cry. Um, in front of the team and um, you know I, I cried on the retreat and, and I said you know this is um, a, a retreat where we're going to do lots of laughing um, but we're also going to cry and that's okay um, and you know some of my most vulnerable moments are actually talking about how amazing the team are because that makes me um, really emotional because that's you know this the, 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 the clinic is my baby um, and so talking about how amazing the team are gets me really emotional. And I see people in the in the team particularly um, displaying our values. That's my weak spot. So that's where I get really emotional and that's where I shed tears because that's that to me is just amazing. You know, when, when we've got values up on our wall, at the clinic and, um, you know, I, I feel we live our values every day. But when I see examples and I captured some of those examples throughout, or actually Claire captured some of those examples throughout the year because I, I was, when I was on leave and she sent me some photos of um, some of our team showing those values and I shared that in our retreat and that made me emotional and I, I had shed some tears and I, I ex explained to the team that that's, um, that's my weak spot. That's when I see it's, it, they're, they're happy tears. They're, they're yeah, joyful. yeah. That, that that's my my moment of vulnerability is when I see the you know because it, it it's my business, it's my company. But when I see the team showing just as much commitment to the company yes. um, and so, just as much care for each other and care for our clients and care for each other um, and and you know, living out our values every day, that gets me. Mm. It's quite a moving experience, uh, especially when you put so much effort and care into them and your clients to be seeing that also happening on their behalf uh, with one another and with you and with the clients. Uh, yeah, what an experience for you. When it comes to the vulnerability side of things, you know, often folks who are listening in will say, like, I get it. I understand I need to be vulnerable with my team, but uh, either I'm scared about how that's going to be received or I'm not in really sure how to show that vulnerability. Can you maybe share some insights as to how you've gone about doing that with your team? Maybe even reflecting on the last few years, as you mentioned, being particularly hard for Melbourne-based clinics and pediatric-based clinics especially. What were some of the moments of vulnerability uh, that you had to share with your team? Some some examples there. Yeah, I, I think um, if, if we think about, you know, I mean, obviously I've had some personal journeys that I've had to, to share with the team. So I think it's being, um, one, it's having the space to do that. I think it's making sure mm -hmm. that your team are all together. Um, when you're sharing, um, you know, important personal stuff. So mm -hmm. making sure that they're in the one space and you, you, um, you've got them all together and, and you, you yeah. tell them you're about to, you know, you've got to give them warning that you're about to <laughs> share something. Um, yeah. that, that's pretty personal and pretty um, vulnerable and that, that, you know, you've, you've taken the courage to do that and that mm -hmm. you're doing it because you feel um, 
comfortable uh, in their presence so that you nice. um, you're trusting them and that's why you're sharing this information with them and um, that they're on the journey with you. I think when it comes to more business um, focused things, again it's 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 sh sharing with them that they are on the journey with you. Um, I've, I've done that in in our in our team and building our team and our team culture. We've done a lot of work on our team. Um, over the last um, 12 months in particular, I would be, I think, mm -hmm. and our team had seen a lot of turnover during COVID yes. um, with, our, um, with our team. Um, and that was that was hard. It was hard to have our team see um, people come and stay for a, a short period of time. Um, and we've got some really, really loyal, amazing team members, but they saw people come um, and stay for a short period of time. So what, what we've done in that is bring them along um, the journey with us in our recruitment. So they okay. are now a part of um, our recruitment and, and we've shared that with them and we've shared our why mm. with them and why we do that. And, and that's because we've built a really awesome culture and we work really hard to build that awesome culture and and not everybody gets to be a part of this awesome culture that we've built so we want them to help choose who gets to be a part of this culture so mm -hmm. we've come from a really a place of being vulnerable and and having that high um turnover which i think um you know we weren't alone in that during the Melbourne lockdowns and and the pandemic, we, it wasn't just us having that high turnover. Yes, so yes. it's un, it, it, it's accepting that this was not a personal um, <laughs> attack. We know it wasn't just us, but to come out of that, we had to change the way that we were recruiting, and we had to, um, you know, we had to understand that we were farming, not hunting. Uh -huh. um, you know, um, Shane you know, drummed into me <laughs> a number of times. So, and we really embraced that, uh, and we really changed the way that we were recruiting. And so now, a, a key part of our recruitment is that our team are involved in that process. Yeah. And um, it, it doesn't matter if if I think that a, a candidate is. Uh, meets all of our criteria and, and our practice manager thinks that they do, our team have to agree with that and our team mm -hmm. have to meet them um, and and think that they fit the culture at Solution as well. And how do you practically go about doing that? Because you've got quite a large team. Is yeah. it everyone is involved in that? Is it just some? Can you walk us through some right. of the so, Yeah, so we have two of our team. Um, so after we've gone through the the formal recruitment process uh, we have two of our team um, members and we rotate who that is yes. sometimes it's just um, down to availability of um, in the practical sense in the, the way the diaries work um, but it, it's typically rotated um, and two, two team members will take um, the candidate out for coffee with I'm really lucky with where we're located. We're surrounded by um, cafes, so they'll um, just pop downstairs to uh, a cafe and have a really relaxed, casual catch-up with the candidate as our last step um, in our recruitment okay. process. So then um, I think it's great. It works both ways. It's great for the candidate to suss out the culture as well and see who they're going to be working with, um, feel a bit more relaxed to ask some of those informal questions um, that yeah. they might be thinking uh, and, you know, really our, our team are also sussing out whether they can work um, yes. with this person and do they think that that candidate is a good match for our culture. Mm, it's a great, great way to do it, to have them engaged in that process. I know one of the things that you've been passionate about is mentoring team members, um, especially early stage or early career team members. Um what is it that lights you up about doing that? I think it's seeing the growth um, yeah. in in a psychologist when they they're raw um, from their university. We all know that when you know we we study for um, you know six years uh, to become a psychologist, and you you come out of that, you've got all all of the theory um, and all <laughs> of the knowledge 
and very little very little practical <laughs> experience even though look you know in psychology you, you know we do quite a lot of placements and yes. do have quite a lot of practical experience but we still know nothing um and so it, I, I think seeing that growth from um you know from that first day um mm. on the job or that first you know first those first moments to even where they they are at the end of their first year I think that lights me up and seeing that progress uh, that they make in their first one two three years mm. as a psychologist that that's my that's my passion that that seeing that growth and development in in all of um my team and I know I do external supervision as well so it's not just in in my team members it's in all um in all psychologists and I don't just uh, mentor early career you know I mentor um you know a lot a lot of senior psychologists as well so I just think it's that support that you can give back to the profession um that that lights me up that is wonderful similar to the story you're sharing about the values being able to see them displayed something that you've shared and then you're seeing it displayed um by someone who gets it lives it breathes it what are some of the principles or approaches that you bring into your mentoring of team members that allow you to create or facilitate that growth for them how do you go about it how would you describe your approach to helping people grow and develop this is a very good question i just redid my board approved supervision course um, which we have to redo every five yes. years. Um, and we 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 looked at these models of of supervision, and I'm thinking, what where do I fit in my <laughs> model of, of supervision? I think I do uh, I think I do a lot of um a lot of listening and and a lot of um I have a lot of empathy for um the position that my mentees are in, but I also think I do a lot of teaching. Mm-hmm. I think I do a lot of teaching of um, bringing my knowledge and my 25 years of having worked in with those particular clients and this is how I would. Um, and I think that's generally the types of questions that I get is this is how I would do it. And the, the feedback I get from my supervisees is they don't just want to be... Um, they don't want that reflective, oh, how would you do it? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And I think that, that <laughs> when they come to me from other supervisors, they find that frustrating. They okay. find that, that um, if they knew how to do it, they wouldn't have done it. <laughs> and so <laughs> they come to me with wanting answers, wanting to know. Um, we'll, we'll, so there is that, that part of it, wanting to check, fact checking, you know, this is what I've done you know, am I on the right track? So there's that that one part of it. And that's the listening part. I think that's the listening part. I just want to run something by you. Do you think I've done this in the right way? Um, whereas I think the other part is I'm just stuck. Um, what would you what would you have done if this was your client? So I think yeah. that's the teaching part. So I think that I I I that's probably the majority of my supervision would be this is what I would have done or what I would do in that situation so I think that that's probably what I do best yes. is, is that teaching because I do have that 25 years um, of experience and, and have worked with such a breadth of clients that there's probably not a, such a problem solver so even if I haven't seen that presentation I can problem solve my way out of that mm. situation so I, I can always come up with a solution um, which is probably why <laughs> psychology I can always come up with a solution to help them navigate so you know so so teaching and, and problem solving and listening I think would be my approaches to um, supervision mm. I'd love to hear the answer that one of my supervisors <laughs> <laughs> Good question to ask. Uh, so as part of that, you are very passionate about pediatric psychology and, and training the next generation of therapists that are, that are coming on board. 
uh, and as you said, across the range of experience, but in, in particular, the, the new ones. What is it uh, that you're seeing about the profession that you're most excited about um, moving forward into the future? Because no doubt you've seen a lot of changes over 25 years. How, you know, what position is the profession in today as you see it and what are you optimistic about moving forward? Look, I think um, even just the last couple of months, recruitment has changed. We're getting, um, we're certainly getting some really exciting applications. Um, we've just hired five new psychologists for the start of next year. Um, cool. I'm, I'm excited about um, people wanting to work in paediatrics. Paediatrics is hard. Um, even, you know, I, I mentioned before, I just redid my board approved supervision course and I flew to Brisbane to do that. And, and the, the belief is that um, there's a real shortage of, of paediatric psychologists. Most people don't want to do paediatrics because it is, it's harder than adults because for every, well, you know, my, my, my theory on why that is, is because you don't just have one client in paediatrics, you have three, you know, you have um, or four, you know, if you want to count both parents, four, but I, I say three because you've got the client, the child, the parents and the, and the school. So you've got three groups of, of clients and um, and that's time consuming because yes. your session doesn't end um, at the 50 minute mark because you've got the communication that needs to happen with those other parties. So the admin involved in, in paediatrics is just so, so cumbersome. So a lot of people, uh, if they had a choice, um, would say, well, I'll just go and work with adults because... I can do my 50 minute session, write up my case notes, do a couple of GP letters, and there's not really a whole lot of other admin compared to um, working in the paediatric space. You know, then you've got the complication when you bring in, um, you know, separated families, um, mm -hmm. you know, disability, NDIS space. We've just got so many complications that come with working with paediatrics that it just, it takes a real passion um, mm. to want to work in this space. Um, in the people that come to me, they have that passion. So when they're coming to a paediatric only clinic, mm. I don't have the difficulties of trying to convince these people to take on child clients because we're a paediatric only clinic. So whereas in mixed clinics, you might have that, that added complication of trying to get your clinicians to see the child clients because they've got adults that they can pick up and, and yep. easily see. We're a paediatric clinic, so when they come for a job with us, they know that all the clients are, are paediatric. So they come to me with a passion uh -huh. to work with children. So, and I'm, I'm having no, at the moment, um, we're, we're not having a difficulty filling our positions, whereas 12 months ago, we, we absolutely would have had um, a, a real crisis mm. in recruitment. We're not seeing that now. So I would say the, the most exciting thing about the future is um, that we don't seem to have this crisis in, in recruitment anymore. So fingers crossed that continues um, and that we are really building the confidence of our graduates to, mm -hmm. um, to, to stay, to come and then to stay um, building that um, resilience of our graduates to um, hang around um, <laughs> in the field of paediatrics because the burnout rate is also really high. So, you know, that's if, if we can get them in and we can keep them in paediatrics by, um, you know, letting them um, know that there are amazing practices where we can, we, we really foster that culture and really foster um, you know, looking after yourself and and not burning out. Um, I, I think that's our, that's the exciting thing that it, it's a sustainable um, profession where you can, um, you know, you can you can work in paediatrics for a really long time and enjoy it. So. Well, we had uh, on a previous episode uh, a colleague and friend of yours, Hannah Dunn, and I asked Hannah, uh, "What question would you have?" for our next guest an episode not knowing who it was and hannah asked um you know i'd love to know from another clinic owner how they go about retaining team members um because that is also quite a challenge can you speak to that now that you've referenced it around yeah we can bring them in and and nurture them grow them develop them 
then we want to be able to see a pathway for their continuity um, here at the clinic. How do you go about it? What are some of the, the nuances of solution psychology creating pathways for retaining quality team members? Yeah, great question. Um, for me, it's it's uh, making sure that my team, two things, know that they're valued and don't burn out. Uh, and I think uh, the burnout is particularly important in, in the yes. psychology space. Uh, so it's setting, um, it's setting KPIs that are going to work for the business because it is a business that needs to be sustainable. Yes. Um, so making sure that your your team know that it is a business and that needs to be sustainable and that without it being sustainable, they don't have a job. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, we make that really, really clear from, from the beginning. So it's making sure that that, that is well known, but that the KPIs are set um, realistically and achievable mm -hmm. um, for the team. So making sure that the, the business side of things is set up um, really well, but to a point where the team members feel that they can achieve and sustain. Um, and I think that we're, we're at a point where we've done that and we've done it really, really well to the point where we, we've just come off six months of being at 99% capacity, um, wow. which is, is amazing. And I think we can only do that by our team feeling um, really, really valued and not feeling any pressure um, to go above what their KPIs are. They do that because they, they have clients that they feel they want to support, not because we say they have to. They've got the KPIs that they, that they need to achieve. Um, anything, above and, uh, anything above that, they're rewarded for. So I think feeling, making your team feel valued and rewarded for the, the effort that they put in, um, doing the little things, um, you know, making your team feel valued for everything that they do. So my team, um, you know, if you follow me on, on socials, my team were given so many gifts over lockdown, um, you know, if anything from posi socks to, um, you know, morning tea sent to their home to fruit boxes. I think it's just those little things of showing your team that you care, showing your team that you appreciate them, feeling valued, this retreat, you know, the constant comments from my team about how much they appreciated it and feel felt valued. Um, we did, we always do the rosebud thorn activity um, on our reflections. So, um, and, and overwhelmingly in the, in the rose um, column was culture and team and feeling valued and feeling listened to. Uh, we do reviews with our team and in our end of year wrap ups, the overwhelming feedback was feeling listened to by management. So that is a key part of retention. If your team feel valued and listened to, they're less likely to go and look for another job. Mm. Yeah. So having those constant things throughout the year, constant supports and structures, we do six months reviews and 12 months reviews, but they're not reviews that are based around they're not, we don't make them performancey. Like, yes, we're reviewing performance. Our end of year reviews, we were reviewing performance, but it didn't feel like that. We took each team member out for lunch and we sat them down and we looked at their, cal you know, what do you want your calendar to look like next year? Yes, we were reviewing your performance, but it didn't feel like that. It, that was more of a, you know, a, a little checklist thing you did before you came to lunch, but the lunch felt very much about you and what do you want your team your your week to look like next year so giving them as much um autonomy and yes um in into their diaries so i think that it's all those little things that you can do to help um your team feel valued supported um as a team member and then there's the the burnout what can you do to make sure that your team are doing enough to support you as a business owner and and to support the business um financially but you know not too much that they're going to burn out yeah it is quite a big one especially uh in the pediatric space is the burnout there's quite a lot involved as you were talking about how do you go about having the conversations with team what, what are some of the things that you use in your approach when their performance is missing the mark. Maybe they aren't reflecting the values like you had set and want to see displayed. 
how do you go about having those tougher conversations where it's not going to plan? Yeah, yeah. Um, look, this is not my strength. <laughs> <laughs> it's tricky for a, a lot of people, myself included. Yeah, yeah. I, I think, it, again, it's it's that um, reflection. So getting them <laughs> to, to reflect on um, on their per- performance and using data, I'm very much into um, statistics and data. So we have having the data to back you up. Uh, we send out weekly uh, mm-hmm. data, so our, our dashboards go out weekly. So it would be looking at uh, bringing them back to the data. Can you talk to me um, about the data? What's your diary looking like? Looking forward um, to their to their diary and problem solving with them. So. Um, mm. rather than, than reflecting back on what has happened, looking forward and saying, okay, so um, we look at um, at four-week forward data. So, yes. um, you know, let's, let's, you know, talk to me about the next four weeks. I can see that your diary is at, you know, 60%. What can we do to help you um, get that diary up to, you mm. know, 80 90 percent in the next four weeks mm. and and make it a conversation about us um, rather than about them how can we help you what do you need from the crt team what do you need from the practice manager how can we help you to get that diary full um, so just focus on on um, solving um, yes. the problem rather than so i'm very very much into solutions rather than problems so what can we do to fix it um is there anything um going on that i should know about Mm. and and moving forward the crt you mentioned client relationship team just for those listening in uh to that um is is a really nice reframe and distinction on on uh admin reception uh support team members what I love about that, Melissa, is like the open-ended questions as well, like talk me through it, um, you know, what are you saying versus often is the case we feel the pressure maybe to really point out here's what's going wrong and almost we're telling people off. Uh, often when speaking with clinic owners, they feel like they have to come to that conversation with that type of approach versus like you're saying it's a collaboration We're going to find the solution together and using those open-ended questions to get them to reflect on it is a really great method to be able to use. I'm interested, you you said there that, um, I can't remember if you said it wasn't quite your strength or the thing that you liked. What is your genius in, as a business owner, genius being like your circle of competence in your wheelhouse, something that you feel particularly strong at and good with when it comes to business because we juggle so many different hats right um or we spin so many different plates but what is it that you feel really in flow doing on a daily or weekly basis you feel this is where you add the most value uh, definitely in supporting the team a hundred percent um in that's where i excel in in supporting the team and adding value to um, i'm always there for the team um always they can if i'm not um in the clinic um which i'm not i'm not in the clinic a lot there's not necessarily enough room for me in the clinic we're bursting at the seams i am at home um working at home and we have we use teams um and they can message me on teams and i am always available to the team so some would say too much um but that, that is my strength, that they can come to me and I am always available to the team, to support the team. Um, probably something that I, I need to outsource a little <laughs> bit, uh, but I'm always available uh, to the team. I, I do love doing um, the finance stuff as well. I love yeah. looking at, at the numbers and, um, and looking at that end of stuff as well. But where my strength is, is, is in um, support the team and um, has that always been always been the case with the numbers like what's your journey been with numbers because it is quite common for health professionals to be confronted when all of a sudden the business side like give us an insight into your journey with numbers now to the point where you're like you know what I love the numbers yeah 
no, I, I don't, I, I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm good at it. I enjoy, but I enjoy looking at, I, I really enjoy now the director stuff. Like I, I wish I could spend more time on the director stuff and reading business books. And I just, I wish I had more time to just do that stuff. Um, it, while I love supporting the team. I, I, I wish I had more support to do that so that I could step away from that more and do more director stuff like I've you know I've got a director role description and I reckon I do you know two percent of the things on the director role description because I'm 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 so busy still supporting um, the team so you know so one example psychologists have to do um endorsement supervision and, and they have to do that weekly and so for all of our team that are doing endorsement supervision that falls on me mm -hmm. to do that because we don't have another um team member who can do that I would love to to have someone else who can take some of that on so that I can step away a little bit more um, and do more of the, the director duties. So um, that's what's next, I think. Um, yes. Is, be, is being able to love to dive further into, you know, I love looking at our rolling break even and, um, you know, looking at, at the future direction um, of, of the, the business. Yeah. Great opportunities to come then with that. You reflected on the the hardship adversity of COVID, uh, especially in Melbourne, and uh, the fact that being vulnerable with your team has been a really great thing for you to do. How would you reflect on your evolution as a leader? Because you make this transformation or transition from therapist, build up a caseload you, as a business owner, then you start to bring on more team members we go through quite a transition and progression as a leader. As you reflect on the last few years, are there any other things that stand out that you feel have been important milestones or skills or developments that you've had as a leader? Obviously, being vulnerable was a key one. What else comes to mind for you? Yeah, look, I think I think for me it started when when I got sick. So, you know, 2019. Um, when I I had cancer and cardiomyopathy diagnosed both within a short space of time, yeah, wow. um, that was my my wake up call to step away from client work. Well, um, forced um, <laughs> by my my medical team, <laughs> um, you know, telling me, and you you'll remember, um, you know, telling me that I had to, I I really had to. Um, I had to, you know, step away from seeing so many clients. And and when I was recovering um, from my surgery, I read um, Radical Candor um, and Dare to Lead, um, Kim Scott and um, Brene Brown, and and they were my light bulb books um, mm -hmm. because they resonated with me. Not because no, I, I don't think I I wouldn't say I learnt a huge amount of new information. They just resonated with me. They resonated with my values and they just said to me, this is how I lead. Mm. Naturally, this is how I lead. And I think that started my journey of leadership as a business owner. I was always, I think, leading as a mentor and as a supervisor, but that started my journey of leading as a business owner and really shifted my thinking in terms of I, I now need to lead in a in a different way and separate that supervisor role from that business owner role um, and so that's when I, I then um, came to clinic mastery and that's when my journey I think really um, started to shift and of course you know then we went into to lockdown um, so we we just then became came into survival mode. So then it wasn't about progressing the business. It was then about how do we survive um, this storm um, <laughs> that has has is going to hang around. And and it, you know I, I I remember being really you know really on the front foot. I remember watching and and I think this is another um, strength of mine as a business owner is that I I don't sit and watch things unfold I, I I get in and I get it done and I get it done quickly and I remember March 2020 I had all my policies already done I had everything um, wow. 
every COVID policy written, everything was ready to go. And I think it was August and people were still asking questions about um, different policies. And my, I had this done months ago. Yes. Um, well so and, and it was hard. It was yeah. really hard. I, I worked really, really hard. I didn't, I, you know, really, really long day. I mean, you know, the, the hours I was working for a very, very long time. Um, and so that's just what I did because I just, I, I see the problem and I get in and I get, get it done straight away, whatever it takes at mm. whatever cost. And so, you know, then it was just survival mode. Um, my, my policies were written and, and everything was implemented, but then it was just survival mode to get through um, this 100% online pediatric business you know, working with, you know, three, four, five-year-olds via telehealth. But we, you know, my team, they, they smashed it. You know, we were right, running groups online um, when wow. no one out, like it was, I reckon 12 months later, people were saying, oh, is anyone running groups online? I'm like, <laughs> we've been doing that for 12 months. Um, Hold on. And in really, really innovative ways. You know, one of my team members was making up packs and sending it to family so the kids would get excited because they'd get this package arrive at the door and in that pack they'd have all of the the materials that they would need for session one and session wow. two that would be ingredients that they needed to make slime and um you know <laughs> everything that they needed a little pack for the parent to go off and have make a cup of tea and light a candle while the kid the child was in the session with with us so we you know we were nailing it um while everyone else was still running around going, oh, COVID, COVID, what are we going to do? Um, so, you know, <laughs> I know that we, um, you know, it, it was a storm, but we were absolutely, you know, sailing that storm, um, you know, like like the, like superstars that my team are. And that's why they're so amazing at what they do because they just, they, they see a, a problem and they just go, right, how are we going to do this? Um, it doesn't mean it's not, it wasn't hard. Mm. It was hard. It was hard. But they, they just said, All right, right, how are we going to do this? You know, yeah. not, not we can't do this. How are we going to do this? And, you know, we got through that. So I think that, that those two books and then, you know, that decision to join um, CM and then just just to stick that out and just to go, right, you know, this is a journey. It's a it's a journey, and um, it's not a it's not a six month commitment. It's not a twelve month commitment. It's something um, that I can see um, progression with. And I think once we got through, it wasn't until we got through COVID. It wasn't until this year, really. I think it wasn't until this year and things started yeah. to really settle that you know. Shane and I could really start actually doing some proper work <laughs> together and really? start to, yeah, really say, okay, what's next now and, and what's the next chapter look like and really start to make that business growth, I think, yeah. What's it been like working with a coach and a mentor um, in that capacity? Like you said, you kind of made that shift of now I'm uh, leading as a business owner, what's it been like for you to have someone there that you can support you, like who supports the leaders? Can you give some insight into your journey having that support, especially over the last couple of years? Yeah, um, look, it's been great. I think the, the, the couple of things that uh, have really stood out for me is understanding the business side of the business. Uh -huh. um, but I I've really enjoyed understanding dashboards and RBEs and um, all of the financial end of things, um, you know, yes. how to set up my zero properly. I, I really enjoy that much more than I thought that I would. Okay. Um, so I've really enjoyed understanding that end, which I had no um, clue about mm -hmm. how to do that before. So really um, that journey I've really appreciated and, and really enjoyed. Um, and I think the second part that I really value is um, my personal journey in understanding my, val my personal values and the impact that other things have on my personal values and how much, how much impacts 
my <laughs> personal values and oh that's why I'm frustrated with that it's because it's a clash with my personal values so I think that's really 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 important and I think something else that, that I really value that Shane does um, has, has probably worked really hard on with me is getting me to acknowledge my own role in everything um, that solution psychology is so I'm, I, that's not a strength of mine. <laughs> um, I tend to outsource um, acknowledging everybody else. And I think that um, Shane has helped me acknowledge my own role in, in what we've been able to a, a, accomplish and, and achieve over the last, um, you know, a few years. So I, I think that's been, I appreciate, you know, being led on that journey of, of um of growth myself and being able to say yeah I I, I work I, I work really really hard um I work really long hours and it's okay to say um I did that <laughs> yeah. yeah nice uh I agree it's something that uh, I've also learned from Shane Davis uh as well he asked the question what do you want to acknowledge yourself for uh, you know this week, yeah. this month, this year, it's a wonderful question uh, for reflection because, like you said, we rarely pat ourselves on the back. So it's a good good piece of accountability. Just something to pick up there around the finances side of things. How did you go about perhaps reconciling the meaning that you associate to serving clients and the care in healthcare and making money and being profitable as a business owner. So often people can say they're at odds. How can you really care about people and also want to make money? Uh, how have you gone about kind of reconciling that element of being a health professional in business? Yeah, I think that's come down to, I think COVID did that, honestly, for me. Yeah. I think COVID did that for me. I think you know, this is my my 25 years of being registered and, and I'm tired. <laughs> um, and, and I think I, I came pretty close um, this year to, to making a decision of, of, I actually gave myself a deadline of really? um, of August of it's either um, close or ex, uh, expand. And... I actually told my cardiologist that that was my deadline because he said something's got to he said something's got to change. You've you've got to make a decision. You can't keep um, you can't keep working the hours that you were yeah, working. Yeah. This, this was in um, this was in May, and um, he said that you know that, that that's it. You've, you've got to you've got to make some changes. And I said I've given myself till August. We were going on an overseas holiday in August, um, and I said by August I will have. Um, decided to either close or expand. He said they're two pretty extreme. <laughs> and that's closed not necessarily because of how the business is performing, right? It's just the toll that it was having on yeah, you. Right. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it, it's just, I, I, yeah, there, there, were, there were a lot of things happening um, in the business at the time and, yeah. and it, it, was, it was just me being just tired and um, just how much more have I? personally got to give yeah um, yeah do this and, and how much longer have I got in me in this in this industry um, and how do, yeah so like there's some like reflective questions no doubt you entertain but how did you go about making the decision like what was part of your process for, yeah, for so, that? so I always I always knew uh, look, I probably always knew the answer um, wasn't going to be. Can't shy away from work. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I think, and I, I know that when I do eventually stop working, I don't want it to feel like I want to go out on a high. I want to go out on a high. I don't want to ever go out feeling like something wasn't finished. I don't want to ever go out thinking, I wish I had have done this or I wish I had have done that. And if I had finished in August, it wouldn't have felt complete. Uh, so I knew in the, in the bottom of my heart, I knew that it wasn't going to be 
in August. And if it had, have, if I had have been forced to have finished up in August, it wouldn't have felt complete, and I would have, mm. um, it just wouldn't have felt right. So we did turn things around. Um, recruitment, you know, was one of those things. Culture was huge, a huge change for us. We made a couple of really good appointments. Uh, so, you know, things have changed a lot since May for us. And, yeah, it, 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 I think the answer is obvious, but expansion, <laughs> it was. Yeah. Keep on going along. Uh, that's, yeah, what, what you've created and, you know, being able to see uh, your journey in various uh, time points and to various degrees, it's, quite incredible to see the work that you are doing and the team are doing for uh, your local community uh, as well. It's, it's quite amazing. So yeah, big, big kudos to you. Um, I'm interested to know from your perspective, if you would ask a clinic owner a question to figure out how they tackle any particular part of being a health professional in business, what question would you ask them? I would ask them, how they switch off. Uh, <laughs> nice tie-in. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, I, you know, I think I've had a goal for the last um, three or four years to work less, um, to take um, Mondays and Fridays off um, or block them out in my calendar to certainly not be available to team. Um, I, I had a coaching session this morning. It's another goal for next year. Um, I, I feel finally, finally actually able to do that. So I think next year's the year. Um, but that's what I would love to know is how that how they um, switch off from the business. Yeah, great question indeed. It's always great to hear from other people and learn from them and see how they approach things. So I've really valued your insights today about your journey and how you've gone about things, a little peek under the hood as to how you've navigated some of the challenges and hardships, especially over the last couple of years, but as part of a you know, massive career over 25 years. Um, it's awesome for mine to see people like you who are passionate about the profession and about the ripples through helping the clients that you help as well. Um, because I think small business, private practice so much. We are the hubs of where the next generation uh, come from and the skill set, uh, the philosophies and approaches are passed on and through uh, small businesses, private practices. So it's awesome to hear your passion uh, come through. Thank you very much for joining us on this episode. Thanks, Ben. Thanks for tuning in to the Grow Your Clinic podcast. To find out more about past episodes or how we can help you, head to www.clinicmastery.com forward slash podcast. And please remember to rate and review us on your podcast player of choice. See you on the next episode.